Dr. Loris Kalchin is Professor of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Iowa. He also did his Master's of Divinity and PhD in Religious Ethics at Yale University. Dr. Kalchin's talk is titled From Conscience's Practice as Salt and Light and Love. I think that you'll come out of this presentation with some confidence and tools on what it means to be a Christian in the classroom, in the clinic, and in the hospital setting, tactfully, yet unapologetically. Christians need not leave their faith at home, but they need to find ways to integrate their worldview into the ethical issues that we're facing, such as physician-assisted suicide, or as we call it, MAID. I know that you'll enjoy this video. It's wonderful to be with you all here today. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And and thank you to all those who have spent so much loving time and attention in organizing this meeting. A couple weeks ago, back in my hometown, I was involved in, a, in organizing a small conference. And I'm profoundly aware of the fact that nothing good happens without a huge amount of work. And thank you very much for allowing me to be part of things here today. Let me also say that, as Peter mentioned, <clears throat> one could say that I'm on native soil, even though I would that soil was given to me by citizenship, et cetera, rather than by place of residence. But more important than being in Canada, as lovely as that is, especially since my wife is also with me and she's a real Canadian, I'm just one of those sort of paperwork Canadians. <laughs> um, but uh, more importantly is I'm on my native turf as a Christian here, and I'm able to speak in my native language. And I spend a lot of time in with different contexts, with different audiences and the kind of work that I do. And I don't need to tell physicians in Canada uh, the significance of what it means to be salt, to try to be salt and light and to be faithful uh, at times such as these. And being someone who works in, in medical ethics, in clinical ethics, bioethics, all that, uh, it's certainly a constant place of good challenge. And I'm grateful to be able to be with you all today. So I have a couple slides just by way of introduction. The first has the objectives that have already been uh, published in the program. I have no conflicts, conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, but a few introductory slides. The first is familiar to you. So Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I don't know about you, but I find it profoundly comforting to think that in this respect, nothing is new, <clears throat> right? From the very beginning, uh, we, as Christians, were aware uh, that this is the nature of the world that we live in, uh, but this is also the nature and the power of the Lord we serve. So whatever we might say about the darkness and the troubles of the times, we have a confidence that overwhelms that darkness and that trouble. And I take great joy in that. The other thing I want to say, another thing I want to say by introduction, and these are the pictures of the places where I trained as a medical student, as a resident, and where I now work. Uh, and I want to say, lest I be misunderstood, how grateful I am for how much good I have received in these places. I think there are times when we can sometimes uh, wonder about the world as opposed to the church, etc., and we can see the troubles of the times, etc. <laughs> And it might cause us to diminish unfairly, and I think unlovingly, all the good that God has, has given to us through all sorts of means, regardless of whether or not people acknowledge the source of that good, right? So I just want to make it very clear that I am one happy camper, grateful physician, etc., in that deep respect. I also want to say that I have a profound respect for the doctor-patient relationship, because I think when I'm talking about the kinds of things we're dealing with here today, I could also be misunderstood in terms of what I think the doctor-patient relationship is for and can be used for. And I have a profound respect for the mutual expectations that doctors and patients come to that encounter with. And so I think that one of the things that we have to wonder about is when we're talking about being salt and light, at what times are we talking about being in the clinic, being in the hospital ward, versus being in the doctor's lounge, versus being at a professional organization, versus being at the provincial government offices that Larry Worthen and others are engaging so robustly these days. So I think the way we speak and what we say will be impacted by that. And I think perhaps as you will all agree with me, 
most of us probably have more work to do with uh, how we act than what we say, right? So the whole idea is that our, our, work, our works often speak louder than our words. So with that ado, let me move now on. And I sometimes do this, I begin at the end. So in case you want to know where I'm heading, this is, these are my sort of my bottom lines. Conscience reflects our beliefs, values, and moral reasoning, our ethics. And it's that moral reasoning side that I really want to lay emphasis on today. Because one of the big picture themes is, is that there are people in our society and in our professional organizations who will look at conscience basically as a private issue. Not as a public issue, not as a professional issue. I think that is deeply mistaken. So that's a fundamental point. Conscientious practice affects us. It sustains our integrity. You could call it a harmony between what we believe, say, and do. It also affects others. As salt, it preserves. As light, it exposes and directs. What we believe and value in ethics is not a private matter. When we believe a moral truth, we believe it is true for all and therefore good for all. When we refuse to participate in unethical medical practices, we do so out of a concern for the good of everyone, ourselves, our patients, and our society. And lastly, there is no competition between conscientious practice and love, because there is no competition between love of God and love of neighbor. I'll be coming to that at the end of the talk. So our love for our neighbors sometimes means we must disagree with them and avoid cooperating with their intentions. Our love for our neighbors also means we must respect their freedom to disagree with us and pursue their intentions without our cooperation. So now I'll go back to the beginning. And I'll start, as we often do in medicine, with a patient case in the ICU, just as an example to get us in the frame of mind. So a 72-year-old man with a history of depression is brought to the ER after being found unresponsive after ingesting ethylene glycol to attempt suicide. In the ER, he's intubated and placed on mechanical ventilation. In the ICU, he has encephalopathy, severe metabolic acidosis, and renal failure. His family is informed that the prognosis is dire without hemodialysis, and there's a reasonable chance he will regain consciousness and have an excellent recovery. However, his family states that he would not want to be on life support or receive hemodialysis, and they are concerned about prolonging suffering in the face of an uncertain prognosis. The ICU doctor is concerned about the family's perspective and thinks it would be in the patient's best interest to start dialysis. So what happens next? What moral basis is there for decision making? And having myself actually been in that situation that I just described, with de-identified of course, um, it was striking, of course, as it always is, to watch a doc and watch a family under these circumstances and perceive what's going on. And you realize how there can be no separation between science and ethics, between medicine and ethics. It's loaded with values and beliefs going on. Okay. So I like to refer to the moral dynamic of shared decision making, meaning that what happens in healthcare depends on who is participating in it and what their ethical beliefs and values are. So when we talk about things like informed consent, shared decision-making, I've done some work in practical wisdom in medicine, or if we talk about concepts of health, or just simply communication in healthcare, I would want to join those who would say that everything is loaded, loaded with ethical beliefs and values. It's not a question of whether those beliefs and values are going to come into play, but how and by who, one might say. So differences in our, what I call our foundational beliefs and values reflect the moral pluralism that we live in today in our societies. I'm certainly grateful for all the areas of consensus that we have in the places where we work, but we are also very mindful of the areas of difference. And when I think about the big picture categories, I think of things like freedom, the idea of negative rights, positive rights, how do we think and believe about those? notions of dignity, especially in relation to so-called quality of life concerns, personhood usually divided in terms of functional capacity assessments versus inherent value assessments. Who counts as a, pro as a person? Some people in philosophical circles call that the boundary problem. So before birth, after birth, vegetative state, etc. What are, where do we get the notions of where we draw the lines? Suffering. I find suffering uh, remarkably profound in the sense that it's 
completely permeating healthcare, of course, and yet it's rarely talked about head on, because I think we live in a culture that, quite frankly, doesn't know what to do with it. It's, it's so afraid of it, it doesn't have a way to bring meaning to it. Health, uh, this is another area of particular interest in mind when we think about objective versus subjective notions of health, therapy versus enhancement, needs versus wants, etc. There are lots, all sorts of questions of justice. And then moral objectivity. This is a quote from Tris Engelhardt who said that the focus of secular bioethics is on procedure. The question becomes which individuals have agreed to do what with whom, as opposed to is something good or bad, right or wrong? It's who gets to say about those things. Okay. So, foundational beliefs and values are real for everyone. Here are a couple of quotations from some writers I've benefited from over the years. And one is by Paul Ramsey, who said, Everyone has an ultimate, and no one leaves behind his unargued viewpoints when entering a rational argument. And Jeffrey Stout wrote, none of us starts from scratch in moral reasoning. We begin already immersed in the assumptions and precedents of a tradition, whether religious or secular. Our starting points are inescapable. So this is, I think, also very important because if you're like me, you've been made to feel at times that because you come from a religious tradition, somehow you're specially different and you're on the sidelines. You're not in the mainstream of secular points of view. And I think that that's simply a mistaken way to look at it. And this is a, 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 an author named John Reeder, who I've really benefited from over the years. And I'd encourage you to, to look up his, his uh, piece called What is a Religious Ethic? If you have time to dive into such things. But what he talks about is he says that ethics is about what we believe is fundamentally real and fundamentally good. And these beliefs go all the way down to the foundations of our thinking and acting. And what's important to the point to make here is that religious and non-religious views both make claims about what is good and real. So that there's actually no difference, philosophically speaking, between a religious ethics and a non-religious ethics. And that's really important. And, and I think the way you can sort of test this out is if you're ever having a really good discussion or debate with someone, just if you keep asking the why question, it's kind of like those of you who are or have, have, have been parents, you have a rather intelligent five, six, seven-year-old child who is very good at asking why. And if you're a good parent and a patient parent, you keep giving the best reasons that you can. But eventually you have to rest upon some foundations. And I know as a parent, sometimes, of course, you say, because I'm the papa, that's the final word, and <laughs> it's time to go to bed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but the point is, is that I think often, for instance, if you read the UN Declaration of Human Rights, well, do, what if you ask the people who wrote that, why? Why do human beings have rights, et cetera? They will be as burdened to provide a good answer as any one of us will be. And I would actually suggest that there's a certain inarticulacy among many of our colleagues who have actually not come from a tradition that has given them a language. It's one of the things we can be very grateful for as Christians that we have been given that language. People may not agree with that language or agree with the beliefs in it, but we have that language. So moral pluralism is, is the context we're in. We have different foundational beliefs and values within and between groups, communities, and societies. We also have different sources of authority. This I find to be very interesting in any ethical discussion with students or anyone else. So some people, will, we all rely upon reason, that's for sure, but we heavily in, in medicine and medical ethics talk about evidence. There's a large emphasis on experience. Some people will rely upon tradition, some will reference uh, intuition, and many of us will reference faith. But just the idea of what do you count as an authority is an extremely important part of this whole discussion. <clears throat> There's also that background question of moral relativism. I've myself never met a pure relativist because everyone always has some fundamentals they're unwilling to budge on. But we're all familiar with a basic inclination in that direction, I think, upon, on the part of many people when they're saying, well, Who's to say it's a question of time, place, and people, until, of course, you raise the Nazis. Then they're willing to say, well, yeah, some things are always wrong. Okay. So in the midst of this kind of pluralism, there's a need for dialogue and moral reasoning. And I, when I think about the virtues that we need for that, humility is certainly one. Because there is a truth, right, in the sense that we don't know everything. 
And not only do we need humility as Christians, but we also need humility because we know that we can learn from others around us, even if at the end of the day, <clears throat> we may well conclude that we are still quite confident that we're seeing something more appropriately than someone else is. But we also, in the midst of that humility, need courage to actually go forward and to speak you know, as persuasively as we can, and also, of course, patience to forbear with each other. There's also this ch challenge of translating from one framework to another. So if somebody were to ask you, well, basically, why, why should we care for this patient who doesn't seem to deserve what society is generously giving him or her because this person is basically wasting our resources? I don't know about you, but I've a couple of times had discussions with some medical students or trainees where they've been so burnt out, frustrated, et cetera, and they're wondering, why should we bother with this human being? Right? If one, if one says, well, because this human being, this patient is a human being, right? But when do you get to the deeper levels of saying something like, well, I believe this human being is made in the image of God. If you don't have some deeper foundations, you're in trouble. And it's just a matter of time before you, you burn out, peter out, and quite frankly, probably start mistreating patients because it's so hard in certain contexts. So thank you for, for offering that. Okay. So these are just a couple references for those who would like to, to think more about this perhaps, is, is to think about how even though in our culture and in, in, in political philosophy circles, if you know the name John Rawls, he was very much one who, for instance, said that it would be inappropriate in a public setting, in a public policy setting, for someone to reference the parable of the Good Samaritan as part of a moral argument. And, and I think I agree with those like Nick Walterstorff who would say that Rawls is wrong in that regard. We should, quite frankly, have the freedom to use whatever language and reasons and stories we think are going to be most helpful. And I myself actually have found myself starting in public contexts to make reference to the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that fact has actually assisted in healthcare so because we even have these things called Good Samaritan laws. It's very interesting, right? I mean, that's how permeated our culture is by this remarkable tradition. So I would just encourage you to, to pray for God's wisdom to know, you know, how can our speech be seasoned and graced so that we can say the winning word in that sense to be all things to all people and not to jump ahead. If it's not going to be as helpful to, to speak so candidly, then to, to try to find ways to translate that in other terms. But I think we tend to do things on a case by case basis appropriately. So now moving on to conscience. But first I'd like to bring to your attention, if you have never come across this book, there's a very helpful book by a man named Douglas Langston called Conscience and Other Virtues from Bonaventure to McIntyre. And in case you've never realized it yet, the concept of conscience has a very interesting and complex history. And it goes back actually more than 2,000 years. So one of, the, one of my take, another take home point, which wasn't on that take home point slide, is that if you're ever having a good discussion, or quite frankly, any discussion on conscience with anyone, make sure you each have told each other what you think conscience is and what it means, because people have some very different ideas of what it really is. And I'm not sure even those who have written books about it are at the end of the day sure of all the mysteries involved, but I'll come to maybe some ways to clarify some of that. I know many of you are Catholic in, in this room, and you will be particularly familiar with the connection between conscience and practical reasoning and, and moral reasoning. And that's one of the things that I, as, as coming from the Protestant side myself, I have greatly benefited from the Catholic tradition in this regard, because there's much more of an emphasis on the reasoning aspect of conscience, which will be one of my emphases here. And you can read more about the details later if, if you'd like to. Uh, but one of the things I want to say at the bottom of the slide is that as a matter of moral reasoning, conscience represents your best moral judgment. And that's the reason why we have this basic understanding. And it's really, it's across many divides in both, I think, Christian as well as secular understandings that are more thoughtful about this, that the conclusions of conscience are non-negotiable because you can do no better in the moral life than your best. And there's something about the moral life such that when you've concluded that this is what you're supposed to do, well, you don't have any other choice. You're simply supposed to do it. And that's the case even if it happens to be that you're wrong. And I'll come to that a bit more. That's a paradox which will, needs to be emphasized. Just historically speaking, after the Reformation, 
the, the someone like Langston would point out <clears throat> that the shift in regarding conscience went from a focus on actions to a focus on persons, which is interesting. And so people, like, especially Martin Luther would be an example of someone who would see con the primary purpose of conscience was to allow an individual to see his or her entire self as standing before the judgment of God as guilty or saved. Subsequent understandings to people like Joseph Butler, Immanuel Kant, etc., represent a transformation toward a more faculty-like or instinct-like notion of conscience, which is actually quite important to keep in mind because I think that's, those are the steps toward this idea of conscience as something private and individual. It's, it's, it's your own issue, as opposed to the persistent Catholic tradition that continued to include that rational capacity. So the separation of, of conscience as a faculty from practical reason is part of the, the terrain that we're living on today. I would say that in contemporary assessments, we have the traditional Catholic view that, that strongly lives on. There's a philosopher named C.D. Broad who has a very nice articulation of what some would call the three-dimensional view of conscience, that it involves moral reasoning, morally directed emotion, and moral motivation. I think that if you reflect on your own experience of your own conscience, you'll see that these are swirling together in some mysterious ways. Some would also, in a contrasting view that I think is ultimately mistaken, they would say that the conscience is the motivation to make your beliefs be matched by your deeds. But that still is shy of including the rational component. So once again, I would just encourage you, if you're having discussions with people about conscience, Try to pick up on whether you think that reason is related to conscience. Because some of them, I think, have lopped it off. And if they do that, then they're going to basically be looking at you and say, well, that's just your private business. Why are you imposing that on me or your patient, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So the authority of conscience. The Christian uh, traditions would affirm two things. It's a divine endowment. And I specifically, in my own thinking, of course, refer to Romans 1 and 2 in this regard. But that it's also susceptible to human evil and error. Right. I would also note that in phil philosophical interpretations, there's a heavy emphasis on the connection between conscience and moral agency, and again, this idea of consistency between belief and action. So I think it is the case that, that it even comes in when you hear phrases like, you know, being true to yourself, these notions, that we still, I think, live in a culture that says that if you believe you're really supposed to do something, well, you ought to do it. I don't think our culture, maybe your experience has been otherwise, but I don't think our culture really has abandoned that notion as such. So thankfully, I think there are some resonances across the religious, non-religious side of, the, of that divine. But now this paradox. So conscience is the ultimate subjective authority for each of us as human beings, but it's also fallible. And I think for a lot of people, that just sort of blows their mind. They can't figure out how could it be so ultimate and yet be imperfect. Okay. Well, so conscience, it's uniquely authoritative and binding since it represents our most compelling moral understanding. But it's fallible because we can actually get it wrong. We can be led by conscience to do something that even ourselves, perhaps some of you have had this experience where you conclude afterward, oh, I thought I was being as conscientious as I could, but now I realize that I was actually wrong. And you might realize that because, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's a need to have a properly formed conscience and a properly informed conscience. And if one or both of those is lacking, you can get the errors that come. Okay, but despite that vulnerability to error, it doesn't weaken conscience's authority. So how do we take care to avoid moral error? So moral mistakes and moral reasoning, weaknesses in moral character, and self-deception explain why conscience should never be treated as if it were beyond questioning and dialogue. Conscience needs to be properly informed about relevant facts, moral values, and sources of guidance, and conscience-based claims should communicate how moral beliefs and values are related to moral positions and actions, which requires explanation and reasoning. So another take-home emphasis is that whenever we claim conscience in some way, we ought to be expected to give reasons for that, right? It's not enough to simply say, that goes against my conscience, I'm moving on, see ya. But we have to have something to say. Now that may be hard, right? Especially when you're thinking, I believe that God commands me not to do this. Because, well, the Ten Commandments say so. So are you saying, Loris, that I'm supposed to say to somebody, well, 
that goes against my conscience, and it's because I believe in the Ten Commandments. And then you're waiting to see how crazy someone thinks you are, okay? And yet, at the same time, you know what's actually, I found this very interesting, speaking of the Protestant side of things, when I was learning more about conscience over the years, that if you read the work of John Calvin and Martin Luther, and try to find out what did they believe was in the conscience of all human beings, setting aside for a moment when Apostle Paul talks about their consciences have been seared, I bracket that off as a special case. Okay, the rest of the, the train, when they, when they would write about this, Luther and Calvin would say that the contents of the Ten Commandments are included in what Paul is referring to in Romans 1 and 2 as applying to the law written on the human heart. So maybe it wouldn't be so off to reference the Ten Commandments to someone in such a discussion, right? I'm just, I think these are the kinds of things that we have to think about, but the giving of reasons is key. So because reason is part of conscience, conscience reaches beyond the individual. Okay, this idea of it's like it's, it's something that goes out from us because of the nature of what's in it. And the second point here I think is really important to emphasize too that when we make a claim of conscience, we're saying something about how serious we are. What is the strength of the conviction that we have? It reaches a certain level. And it also should include then this reasoning. We give a rationale for it. That strength I find interesting. I remember one time I was talking to a resident who was very frustrated with having to care for a certain patient in the ICU. Why? Because this resident thought that the care was futile. Couldn't understand why the family didn't realize this man was dying and it was time to let him die. And you could just see the, the tension you know, welling up inside this resident. And I was you know, listening and taking this very seriously. And I said, well, would you say that participating with the team and caring for this man is violating your conscience or integrity? And immediately his shoulders went down. I said, no, 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 I wouldn't go that far. Good. That's an important point to realize. Right? And I think in our discussions, in our own sense of when do we, there are plenty of situations we do in life that we wish we didn't have to do for all sorts of reasons, right? And in healthcare, many things may bother doctors and surgeons, etc. But it's that crossing of the line. So reason makes conscience accessible to other persons, but also open to interpersonal criticism. So if you give a reason, you have to be ready to receive the counter, right? And we should be open to that. So we should not be afraid of being challenged when we give our reasons. Uh, and then we also might even realize that by getting more information through reasoned discussion and argument, we might even revise our positions. So the big picture. Conscience, on the one hand, some people would say is a private matter, which I disagree with and I, and I expect you all do as well. On the other hand, conscience being a publicly relevant matter, we see it this way because it's related to moral reasoning and that an individual then has it's an individual matter, at, at as conscience is, but it has public and professional implications. So it's both individual and public and professional. So here's a little sort of transition slide here to, uh, to use some images. And if those of you who know Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring, I've got some music running through your mind as well right now. But it's the idea of shifting towards integrity. Integrity is a beautiful word, word I think, that it raises various connotations, but we can even talk about architectural integrity or musical integrity. So what is it that makes something fit together and have what we call integrity? Okay, so conscientious practice as integrity. Integrity, we need unity in the moral life and that's what integrity is getting at. Some would consider integrity a virtue that binds everything else together. I like the word integrity because it also is related to the word integration. It integrates things and I also think that you know, it could well be that, that sometimes you might find yourself being more helped by using integrity instead of the word conscience in certain discussions. I, words are powerful, right? They have different connotations, and I think we can work with them that way. Um, but there's a wonderful quotation from Plato, where, and I'll just read it out for you. It's, and it, I like it because being someone who's, I play the violin, so music is, is very meaningful to me, and so I, I very much enjoy musical metaphors. So Plato wrote, it would be better for me to have a musical instrument or a chorus which I was directing in discord and out of tune, better that the mass of mankind should disagree with me and contradict me than that I, a single individual, should be out of harmony with myself and contradict myself. It's pretty... Powerful stuff. Now, of course, if you as an individual are 
out of tune with objective moral reality, you've got a very serious problem. So just being internally consistent is not the end of the discussion. But at any rate, we don't want to be divided ourselves. So I would encourage you to, to consider the possibility of using conscientious practice and integrity interchangeably. I actually believe they're covering basically the same terrain. To my amazement, actually, when I read some of the medical ethics literature published in medical journals, there are some people that I, could, I can provide these references if anybody are interested, who will actually say that you can divide conscience or divide integrity. And they will literally, in published articles and journals, talk about, say, professional conscience versus individual conscience, or personal integrity versus clinician integrity. I, just, I confess I have an allergic reaction to that idea. I, I mean, it's... <laughs> And maybe it's a little too strong because maybe they mean something else by that. Maybe it's the terminology. But the idea that we can be divided in the way that Plato is saying we should never even consider. It just, it, it's, it's the worst form of cognitive dissonance that you could consider. And when I read scripture, I'm reminded in Psalm 86.11, it refers to an undivided heart that fears or reveres God's name and walks in his truth. This notion of an undivided heart. I think is a powerful, powerful one. So I would say that the individual, indivisibil the indivisibility of conscience <clears throat> is really important. And it also addresses the problem that Alistair McIntyre writes very powerfully about as being the problem of compartmentalization. And it's this basically this idea that your standards change depend upon, depending upon your context, right? So you live with certain moral standards in your home, certain moral standards in your church, certain moral standards in your hospital. Right. We all know, I mean, you've probably watched some movies that describe those sorts of, of, of sad contrasts. Interestingly enough, I think also this idea of compartmentalization, even in the broader culture, I think is really important for people to take really seriously, because I think it's one of the reasons, very well, in one sense, it's a direct reflection of this so problem of so-called moral distress, which some of you, I'm sure, have come across in the literature or even do talks and teaching on it. And in this next slide, I want to just suggest to you sort of graphically what I, I, some relationships here. So we all have values, beliefs and values in our practice. We encounter ethical challenges or obstacles. That can lead and does lead to moral distress. It's like any stress. You remember, you've probably heard lectures on there's stress, you stress and distress, right? So stress is like exercise. Stress is not bad. It's just, it's a stress, right? But these things, these encounters cause moral distress. That can lead, if it's not dealt with, to cynicism, which is one of the three dimensions of so-called burnout these days, if you read the burnout literature. And that can lead to compartmentalization, and that can then lead to burnout like that. Now, if moral distress is engaged, including communication and moral reasoning, you can get resolution or recalibration, and I would suggest that conscientious practice does that. So I would even encourage you, for people who don't have the same beliefs and values that we do, they still have conscience. They still want to live, we should assume, an integrated moral life. And so I think we can also encourage people to take conscientious practice seriously as even part of the larger discussion of moral distress and burnout. All right. So now let's move into a, one illustration, the, the, that of, of physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. You're familiar with a lot of this terrain, I know, and that's just a busy, long list of all the kinds of beliefs and values that, that are swirling around in a question as profound as end-of-life care, end-of-life ethics, assisted suicide, and euthanasia. So I, I am assuming this is all familiar to you. On this next slide, I want to draw attention particularly to this desire for control. And when I think about some of the deeper lesions that are responsible for so much, I, I think this has got to be one. And there's a writer named Dan Callahan um, who has written about these things, and he talks about how the movement for legalized euthanasia rests on the assumption that we have a right to and necessity of full control over our fate. He also writes, the argument for euthanasia seems to be agreeing about the centrality and validity of control as a goal. If medicine cannot now give us the health and continued life we want, it can and should at least give us a total control over the timing and circumstances of our death. Gilbert Mylander is someone who I've had the great pleasure to get to know personally over the years and writes beautifully about so many things and very deeply about them. And he talks in one of his articles from First Things from some time ago, trying to orchestrate the circumstances of death 
has the look of one last attempt to be what we are not, the author of the story of our life. Euthanasia misses the irony that we are attempting to master the very event that announces our lack of mastery. These are data from Oregon and their physician-assisted suicide practices uh, after it was legalized some years, years back, um, 1998, I guess, is when they first started collecting data. And when they, they actually collect data, for whatever it's worth, I realize that how do we know how much is or isn't being reported. But when you look at the reasons that patients gave for wanting a prescription so that they can undergo or receive assisted suicide, it's remarkable how permeated these are with beliefs and values. And so when people talk about, well, this is a medical procedure, it just, I think, flies in the face of reason. This is, this is matters of existentialism, if you were to call it anything. And then when I say to medical students, how many of you took a class in existential meaning in medical school? So how is this part of your scope of practice? What ex, what, what, seriously, what expertise do you have? And, and, and without actually, I, I don't support euthanasia assisted suicide in any respect, but if a society really wanted to go there, it's kind of interesting that they would use doctors as technicians as opposed to pastors, priests, and rabbis. I mean, it, the logic, I think, would push in that direction when you look at the rationale that patients themselves are giving. All right. This is a recently published piece. I realize it's a pretty small type up there, but I happened to come across it through, through various reasons. But these are folks from Montre from McGill um, who are psychiatrists who work in a psychiatric ER. And it's a three-case series, rather in-depth discussion of patients who requested euthanasia in the psych ER. And what they're doing is trying to anticipate, which I know some of you know about this in, in Canada, probably all of you do, and I actually happened to meet one Canadian psychiatrist who's part of the group who are advocating to broaden the, the legal you know, eligibility criteria that would include psychiatric indications for euthanasia. And this is a very helpful article that you can see in the text that I've drawn out, makes reference in terms of deciding who is eligible and who not, and says this determination would be a process influenced by many factors, including the clinical experiences, values, and beliefs of the physician. So it's not just autonomy, setting aside psychiatry and depression and all the decision-making capacity issues, but it's, it takes two, right? And so it's not just one individual declaring to the world, I want and I must have. It's going to somebody else who gets to decide the validity of that request. So it's not just autonomy. I'd encourage you to look up that article and, and share it with people because it's got a very good discussion. Okay, so now, Moving on to salt and light, and I've got to keep watching that clock there. Okay. So, how many of you have heard of Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones? So he writes, he's got a couple chapters, as you can imagine, in this book on salt and light. And he refers to salt as having, our having a preserving effect by being who we are and doing what we do. Not yet doing what, not based on what we say, but who we are and what we do said, the need for salt reflects the tendency to fester. There are these germs of evil, these microbes, these infective agents and organisms in the very body of humanity, and unless checked, they cause disease. Salt's main function is negative, not positive. The world needs a preservative, not some tasty seasoning. Right? Christians should have a permeating and preserving effect on those around them. The Christian should be a check, a control, an antiseptic, preserving society from decay. So what are we trying to preserve? When I think about the big picture, I think we're trying to preserve a respect for life, a vision of health, a respect for conscience, a commitment to freedom, both doctor and patient. Freedom is a great gift. I think also, though, that we're trying to preserve a culture of care and encouragement, not only for our patients, but also for our colleagues. And I mentioned burnout earlier, the three dimensions of it, exhaustion, cynicism, inefficacy. There's a lot of need for preservation. All right. Okay. So light, having an illuminating effect by what we say. This is Lloyd-Jones still. He's got this lovely point that he makes in talking about the need, the, the need for light reflects the existence of the darkness of this world. He writes, let us never forget that Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, 
had already given their full teaching several centuries before Jesus spoke these words to his disciples. It was after that amazing flowering of the Greek mind and the intellect that our Lord made this statement. He looked at this band of ordinary, insignificant people and said, you and you alone are the light of the world. So Christians are the light of the world because of the grace of Christ, who is the light of the world. And light has three functions, Lloyd-Jones Jones points out. It exposes the darkness and the things that belong to the darkness. It explains the cause of the darkness and shows the only way out of the darkness. It also talks about, we can think of it, we can read in, in what his interpretation of this part of the Sermon on the Mount as being light as love. So as we heard earlier on this morning, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So Lloyd-Jones reminds us that our purpose in life as human beings, as God's children, is to glorify God in order that others may also glorify him. And we should have a loving sorrow, not just a sorrow, but a loving sorrow for others. The more we draw our life from Christ, the more we become like him who had a great compassion for the people around him. So Lloyd-Jones says that these three things should always be uppermost in our lives. We live and work for God's sake and glory. We desire to lead others to God and to glorify him. And we show love for others and a compassion for them in their need for salvation. How many of you have heard of Leslie Newbegin? I'm curious. That's wonderful. Well, again, I suspect I'm getting, increasingly getting the impression that some of you should be up here talking rather than, than me. So uh, Newbegin uh, was a very prolific man, but he spent many years as a missionary in South India. So he has a, an enormous amount of background that allowed him to think about cross-cultural <coughs> concerns and considerations. And one of his books that I've greatly benefited from is Foolishness to the Greeks. I really highly recommend it. He talks about the plausibility structures. He borrows that phrase from the sociologist Peter Berger. And he says that modern culture presumes a public world of scientific facts and a private world of beliefs and values. This is so related to these issues of conscience we're talking about. And he says that this dichotomy exists even though science is powerless to explain the most important questions of meaning, purpose, and destiny. And even though our culture nevertheless proclaims the central ideology of the autonomous human being and his or her total freedom, nothing else is taken for granted as a starting point. That's back to that point about control. This is so consistent with him. As a result, he writes, when interests are in conflict, the only argument that is not meaningless is, this is what I want to do. In the absence of a reasoned way to reconcile differences, the strong manipulate or coerce the weak, power overwhelms reason. There is no sustaining vision of how things really are. I think one of the things we should work with on an assumption is, is that despite the business as usual approach of so much of what we encounter in life and in our work, I think people are hungry for a vision of how things really are because they're suffering from not being fed by, this is what I want to do. Okay. He also declares, truth must be public truth, truth for all. The church, and I realize specifically this is the church, I'm not talking about you know, CMDS, et cetera, et cetera, but the church can never accept an ultimate pluralism as a creed, even if it must, as of course it must, acknowledge plural, plurality as a fact. We witness to that true end for which all creation and all human beings exist, the truth by which all alleged values are to be judged. The gospel describes the possibility of a life, public and personal, that includes both the ability to hold vital convictions that lead to action and also the capacity to preserve for others the freedom to dissent. I think that gift of freedom, bilaterally, mutually, is, is so important even though it, a lot has to be said about what we think about. Positive rights versus negative rights, that's for further discussion. But this respect of the freedom of patients to go their own way. I must say, as I, I remember when I was an intern and resident, this is one of the hardest things for me to learn, especially after I had invested three or four hours into a great discharge plan. <laughs> and then the patient says, no. And you're, you're, I mean, you're not just upset for their sake, you're really angry about it. You wasted all that time, right? 
And then you realize at a certain point, though, and I, having, you know, I grew up in the HIV epidemic in New Haven, Connecticut. And so I cared for a lot of patients who were just routinely doing things that were evidence of the misuse of freedom. But nevertheless, that gift of freedom was something that I would never presume to want to take away from them. I even spent, I, for a couple of years, I, I spent one day a week working in the state prison system in Connecticut caring for HIV patients. And I remember one patient saying, I, I wish I could stay in prison because he was much healthier and happier in prison because he wasn't left to his own devices outside. And what a profound metaphor about freedom, right? That you need to be constrained in order to flourish. Okay, so then one last uh, author to, to mention here. How many of you have heard of Oliver O'Donovan? Okay, all right. It, it, this, is, this is some heavier reading, if, if, you, if you want heavy, okay? But, um, and he's a remarkably gifted man from, from England, a, a Christian moral theologian. Uh, and he, one of his great books is Resurrection and Moral Order. And he's just, fin I think he finished the third of a trilogy of his sort of even more mature work. He's, he's retired from Oxford now, but, uh, but still with us and has blessed many of us by what he has helped us to understand. He talks in this book about the double love command, loving God and loving your neighbor. And he makes it very clear that this is one love, not two. And I think that's, it's, re it's just really important actually. And he says, God, one God demands of us one love for himself and for a neighbor. Our love of our neighbor recognizes that he, like us, is a being whose end is in God. So there's no competition between God and neighbor to threaten the purity of heart, which is to will one thing. And he makes reference to this idea of ordered love, which many of us associate with, with St. Augustine. And he says that it's ordered love, meaning that you love God first and then love your neighbor, right? And, and yet it's still one love, but there's an orderedness to that. And it's like, especially when you're trying to help your children as they grow up to decide how to make sense of the world and make sense of their loves. And how, and C.S. Lewis, of course, writes so much about this. When our loves are disordered, even a good thing becomes a bad thing, right? So it's that orderedness of love. So he, so O'Donovan says that ordered love is not imposed upon the neighbor from the outside. It belongs to him from the inside. Okay, so that, he says that the neighbor's being imposes the order upon love, not love upon it. We are to love him as a creature destined for his creator's fellowship because that is what his nature demands of us. Our culture is, I think, routinely sending signals, signals to us to say, to suggest, that when we live conscientiously, we're imposing our vision of the good on our patient. Well, Donovan is saying, no, that's not so. Inside of our patient is something objectively true because they are in relationship to God being a creature of God. And in that relationship, we are simply responding to that objective reality in them. We're not projecting our sense of some reality onto them. That's, I think even for me, I still have to dwell on that to realize how profound that is. So we love our neighbor and the reality of our neighbor's relation to God, whether their neighbor acknowledges that or not. So loving your neighbor by refusing to participate in his or her request. Conscientious objection is an act of neighborly love. I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way. But I certainly want to join with O'Donovan to say, to interpret him as saying, that's what it is. So sometimes love must be expressed through disagreement. All of you parents, you know what that means, right? Okay. Sometimes, uh, so we can love, he says, uh, O'Donovan says, we can love a neighbor even when we have to decide against him in a conflict of interest. We love him by taking him seriously as one whose claim must be heard and weighted and as one whose ultimate good must be pursued even when his proximate interest must be denied. So in this love, we respect our neighbor's freedom to act wrongly. We do not try to manipulate, coerce, or impede, even as we also refuse to contribute to our neighbor's wrong intentions. This is a, anyone of you happen to know Dr. Wes Ely from Vanderbilt? Anyone know Dr. Ewan Gallagher in Toronto? That's great. Well, now you, it's, it's you know, six degrees of separation. There are two degrees of separation. Those of you who know Ewan, 
Wes is a, is, a, is a good friend of Ewan, so anyhow, that's just a connection. I happen to know that because I have not we met Wes or Ewan except through email, so I feel like I know them even though I've never met them. In any case, Wes, you should come to know about him, a devout Catholic physician, ICU doc, very highly prolific in publication in the ICU world, etc. But he also gets his ideas out there, and this was a piece he wrote for CNN. And it's, you, can, you can search this. If you just search Dr. Wes Eli, Ely, CNN, you'll find this piece. My patient was alone in the intensive care unit with no family or friends in his life. Gasping, he stared up at me. Admitted with lung fibrosis and pneumonia, he had scars and infection aggressively replacing his airways. His face was blank. I want euthanasia. I'm going to die soon, so what's the point of living longer? I'm just wasted space. My response came in parts over my days with him. First, I explained that, as a physician, I wanted to be with him through the dying process. I told him that I considered us to be in a mutual covenant. We both had a degree of autonomy that had to be respected, but I would never intentionally harm him. Paul, our covenant includes my limiting your suffering, I said. You are the best judge of when you need more meds for pain, anxiety, and breathing. All of us will work day and night to end your distress, but we won't delib deliberately end your life. With our eyes locked, Paul gave his instruction. Just don't abandon me. And we sat there as partners. Paul reminded me that the best remedy for angst is human relationship. I encourage you to read the whole of that online. I'm just going to comment to say that society also benefits from conscience. And you can, again, I apologize, but in the interest of time, I'm going to say that there's a parallel between freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. You start to decrease either of those in society, you should not be surprised at the bad consequences for society of that. And thankfully, there are even legal scholars and philosophers, Christian or not, who recognize that. You've seen that slide before, so I don't need to emphasize it again. And with that, I will say thank you.